Hey, docs, Dr. Clint Steele here. Hope you're doing well. I want to come in. I have a lot of docs that are asking about uh, heart rate variability, what it is, why we should care, why we should, as a profession, start measuring it. And not only measuring it, but measuring it the right way. What I call, it's, it's what I call true heart rate variability measurements. And I'm going to get into why uh, I call it true heart rate variability as, as opposed to, I guess, not true, not true heart rate variability. Uh, but uh, you know, we're we're in the 21st century now. We we have the ability, you know, the, the power behind the brain and nervous system is the ability to adapt, right? Adapt to stress and then recover once that stress is gone. And so as as practitioners, as as practitioners in the in the 21st century, we now have the ability to actually measure our physiologic function and our brain function during stress and then during recovery, which is ideally what we want, right? We don't want to do a measurement where we're where we're measuring something in what I call a static relaxed state. The perfect example is this. Someone comes in, we see this all the time, by the way. Someone comes in, you measure their heart rate, 66 beats per minute in your office in a relaxed static state. In other words, someone's just sitting there in a relaxed static state. Okay, you take their measurement, heart, heart rate 66 beats per minute. Okay, you have a good, good heart health. But what happens if the fire alarm were to go off? What should happen to the heart rate? Yeah, it should go up. And so if it doesn't, is that a problem? And the answer is absolutely. We see this a lot with military personnel, first responders. They're taught to stay calm, keep their heart rate down when it should be going up, which in the case of their job, you know, might be a good thing. But in the case of uh, uh, an actual alarm, fire alarm going off, now their, their heart rate doesn't go up, their blood pressure doesn't go up, so they can't escape, right? They can't escape, they can't survive. Now, on the other hand, and this is where we usually run into a problem, let's say it's a false alarm. You come back into the building 10 or 15 minutes later, what should happen to their heart rate? Well, it should drop, right? Let's say it does go up to 90 beats per minute, let's say. And then 15 minutes later after it's a false alarm, what should happen? their heart rate should be dropping, right? It should come back down. If it doesn't, is that a problem? And the answer is absolutely. And so here's the problem. If we're only measuring physiologic function in a static, relaxed state, are we actually getting the truth? Because going back to heart rate, actually, I'm going to show you right now. Let's just, let's just take heart rate variability. Actually, before I get to that, let me explain it. Because if you, if you graduated like me in, in 1993 or before or you know, shortly thereafter, you don't have uh, any idea what heart rate variability is because we didn't learn it in school unless you learned it on your own, which is what I had to do, what a lot of other doctors do. But most most docs at that age, you know, they've been in, in practice 30, 40 years, even 20, 25 years. A lot of them aren't, aren't familiar with heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is the measure of basically of your autonomic nervous system. It's, it's a way to measure, I should say it's a way to measure autonomic nervous system uh, function. Uh, obviously very important. It does it through one cranial nerve. And I, I'm going to point out one cranial nerve because a lot of people take this one measurement and, and it's the end all be all. And, and that's, that should not be the case. Yes. It's a very important measurement. Yes. We want to take it into consideration, but understand it's not the end all be all. Number two, Understand that your autonomic nervous system is ran by what? It's ran by what? Your brain, right? Your brain, and again, I'm going to have some docs that are going to come. Well, your autonomic nervous system is part of your central, whatever, right? But understand that your brain has to do two things. It has to perceive the environment properly, number one. And number two, it has to communicate that perception to the body properly, number two. And so... One of the ways it does this with the autonomic nervous system is through the cranial nerve, right? One of our cranial nerves or our vagus nerve, one of our cranial nerves, right? And so the reason this is so important is because this cranial nerve helps with communication to and from the brain to heart, to your heart, to your, uh, to your lungs, to your diaphragm, to your, all, all these internal organs in here, right? Comes straight down through, attaches to all those and, and tells the brain, hey, this is what's happening down here. Now the brain can turn around and send signals down to those areas say, hey, this is what we need to do. So for example, the fire alarm goes off, our heart rate should do what? Should go up. Our respiration rate should do what? Should go up. This is an autonomic response. 
autonomic response, right? The brain is perceiving the stress of the environment and then sending messages to those areas, including your digestive system and, and all these internal organs, okay? Heart rate variability is specific, however, to your heart rate and your respiration rate. And in some cases, depending on the technology that you're using, you're only uh, measuring heart rate variability using heart rate, which is not true heart rate variability. Okay, so that's what heart rate variability is. Now, the actual measurement is this. Okay, so it helps us determine how well our autonomic nervous system is working uh, based on communication from the brain down to these organs in here and then these organs back up to the brain, right? The actual measurement is the change in heart rhythm, okay? Heart rate rhythm is actually what it is. Uh, meaning this, most people think that your heart rate should go beep, 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 in the same rhythm. That's not actually the case. What should happen to your heart rate is that when you breathe in, when you breathe in, that's a message to your brain, I'm breathing in. That means my I'm moving into what we call survival mode. Okay. That should increase the speed of my heart rate. So in other words, now I said instead of beep, beep, now it's going beep, 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 beep. And then when we exhale, that tells our brain we can relax. So now what happens is our heart rate should slow down. So we go beep, 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 beep. Okay. And it should slow down. So the actual measurement is your heartbeat, the distance. Now, if you're using time domain measurements, you can use frequency domain measurements. If you're using time domain measurements, basically it's the measure of distance between heartbeats, heart, heartbeat peaks. If you guys have seen an EKG, okay, it peaks and then comes down and then goes boop, boop, and then peaks again. So it's the distance between those peaks. The better the difference is, Okay, or, or the more difference there is in these peaks in, in, in between the heartbeats, the healthier your autonomic nervous system is. Now, that's very important because uh, when, when you have those that are, th that rhythm is the same, that means your brain is not adapting. In other words, when you breathe in, it's not speeding up. When you exhale, it's not slowing down. So it's not adapting, okay? Now, with that in mind, I'll show you what I call the 21st century true heart rate variability measurement. Okay, so uh, what we do is we take, and you can see here, we're measuring basically, uh, or we're showing a graph, basically three different types of graphs. We're, we're showing a bar graph, which I'm gonna go over in detail. We're showing a gauge graph. So you can see this person's uh, heart rate variability score is 12.5%, 12.5%. It should be up to 80, 85. So this person's heart rate variability score is horrendous. And then we got an image for the patient uh, that we can show them showing their heart rate in their, their lungs or their heart and their lungs starting to, to, to build up, right? And you can see this way too low down here at 12.5%. It should be up here at 85, 90%, okay? So I wanna go over this bar graph here with you real quick because this is very important. Uh, first off, understand that if from a practitioner standpoint, you can you can use two different types of measurements a time domain measurement or a frequency domain measurement. I like frequency domain measurements and here's why, okay? And this is what this should look like. You can see this very low frequency right here below 10. This low frequency of, uh, is up here around 80 and then the high frequency drops down here to below 10. So it should be uh, like a top hat formation, we call it. Down, low, high, low. This very low frequency right here is one of the most important frequencies of these three. In fact, it's the most important frequency in my opinion. So as a practitioner, I'm saying to myself, I want to know this. If you're using a time domain measurement, you're not getting this. Okay, if you're using a time domain measurement uh, tool, they basically throw that into these two here, okay? The reason we wanna pull this out is because the, the research is very clear and you can look this up. Very low frequency HRV is consistent when this is too high with increased risk of all-cause mortality, increased risk of arrhythmic death, systemic inflammation, uh, to hormonal issues, especially testosterone issues, uh, the list goes on and on. And so as a practitioner, I, I want to know this. I want to know what this is. 
because this is the start of the heartbeat. This is where the vagus nerve attaches to the heart. That's this frequency here. Then we move into low frequency. This is the ability to move into sympathetic engagement. Should be up here around 80. And then the high frequency here, this is the ability to vagal break, for the vagal break to kick in, for parasympathetic nervous system to kick in, okay? That's where this comes in. Now, this is ideal. This is this patient's. Now, let me explain these, these, bar, these bars here real quick. Because each one of these bars, the technology we use in my office, each one of these bars represents a moment in time during a 12-minute assessment. And this is very important because uh, this first bar, I'll use this, this frequency here to show you. This low bar here is, I mean, this blue bar here is uh, eyes open baseline. So this is basically a static, relaxed state, right? They're just looking around, eyes open. Now, we move over here to this first gray bar. Each one of these gray bars is what we call recovery. Each one of these colored bars is a stress. So eyes open, that's a stress. Just having eyes open, your brain is constantly looking around saying, okay, what is, what's going on? I, I want to be on guard. But when you close your eyes, that's that means we start to recover, okay? Uh, and so that is eyes closed. And then we move into a math test, which is a cognitive stress, and then close your eyes. And then emotional stress, which is sounds that, that they, the patient hears. Uh, and then close your eyes. And then a breathing test, which is a physical stress. And then close your eyes. So we're going through a baseline eyes open, a cognitive stress, an emotional stress, and a physical stress. And after each stress, we go through a recovery period. Again, the power of the brain and nervous system is to adapt to stress and then recover once that stress is gone. Okay, very important. Now, we move over to the patient's HRE. This is the patient's measurement. Again, this static relaxed state. So if you're using static relaxed state measurements to measure HRV, this is, this is fine, right? This person's here is fine here. It's good here. It's good here. This person's HRV is basically ideal from a static relaxed state measurement. However, look at this very low frequency right here. Okay, this very low frequency, what jumps out at you? This should be below 10. See how all these are below 10? What jumps out to you is this green line. Remember, this is the cognitive stress. This person jumps to 80. This is way out of line. Again, this is the start of this person's heartbeat. Okay, do we want to know what's going on? So in their, when they're in our office, fine, everything's fine. But when they go to work and they've got to think through problems all day, boom, they've got a problem with the start of their heartbeat. And this is way too high, guys. 80 is way too high. Like this person right now is at risk of cardiac arrest. And if we're just doing a static relaxed state measurement, okay, just these blue bars, this person's fine. This person's fine. But they're not fine. Because when they go to work and they're, they're actually dealing with life, the stressors of life, this person is at risk of cardiac arrest. That's a problem. And as a practitioner, do you want to know that? So again, this is why we use frequency domain measurements. Secondly, understand that true heart rate variability is the measure of the change of the heart rate based on breathing patterns. So when I inhale, my heartbeat should speed up. When I exhale, my heartbeat should slow down. The question is this, if, you, if you're not actually measuring respiration rate at the same time, how do you know that your heart rate is speeding up during inhalation and slowing down during exhalation? You don't, you don't. So you're guessing, you're assuming that the heart rate is slowing down when it should and speeding up when it should. And that's not the case. That is not always the case. And we see that because we actually measure using a respiration belt at the same time we measure the heart rate. So we can see that they're in sync. They're in harmony. In other words, when the heart, when, when the fire alarm goes off, both my heart rate and my respiration rate should go up, right? And then when it's a false alarm, come back into the office, they both should come down. Are they doing this in sync with each other? Are they doing this together? Okay, that's that's secondly, what the reason I call this a true heart rate variability. And then third, again, I just talked about this. We measure during stress and then also during recovery. Because again, if you're just doing a static relaxed state measurement, Okay, just eyes open, looking around. This person is normal. Okay, or I shouldn't say normal, ideal. But there's a problem here. 
Because when this person's under stress, and, and this person, by the way, eight hours a day, five days a week, 40 to 50 hours a week, they're under cognitive stress. They have a heart attack and you, well, well, basically their heart rate is, is, I mean, the heart rate variability is ideal. I don't understand how they had a heart attack. Everything seems fine, but you didn't know what was going on during stress. That is why it's so important to measure heart rate variability, heart rate, respiration rate, brain waves, all this stuff during stress and then during recovery, because the power of the brain and nervous system and the power of the chiropractic adjustment is to improve brain and nervous system function, right? And brain and nervous system function means the ability to adapt to stress and then recover once that stress is gone. So we've got to measure that doc. So let's, let's level up. Let's move to the 21st century. Let's take our practices to the next level and let's start actually measuring the true power of the brain and nervous system, the ability to adapt to stress and then recover once that stress is gone. Okay, if you want more, reach out docs. Happy to help you. All right, talk to you soon.